Um, and then when you're coming to Sheer, in your code, it gives you this nice little flow chart in the commentary section of like the steps you want to take for design. So the first thing is determine your critical section, and then you would want to calculate if your stress is just like we did with the unreinforced, and that's just the V over Vt. And this is factored, so you'll want to determine your load case for your V. And then, just like with unreinforced, you want to make sure that that is less than your allowable, and your allowable has a maximum based on uh, this ratio, and this ratio is unfactored. So you use your unfactored moment and shear, and um, depending on what it is, it will determine whether you use this for your maximum allow or this. And if your number is between 0.25 and 1, you're just going to interpolate between the two. So that will help for your maximum. And then for your different components, you have the shear and the masonry, and the shear for the steel. And from the masonry, you have this equation, and this ratio right here, if it is greater than 1, then for the allowable masonry, the shear force in the masonry, you will use just one. So you don't want to use a number higher. Um, and then if this number is greater than your calculated shear, then you're good to go, and it's awesome. If it's not, then you can come down here to calculate your allowable shear stress, and that's kind of what this is representing, like you're good or you're not good. Um, so, and then you can calculate your allowable shear stress. Like I said, it's an iterative process, so you're going to think Um, so I went ahead and put an example with the allowable stress design <laughs> method. Um, this is sort of from your book. I got the picture from online, so the numbers are slightly different, but it's essentially the same from your design guide. This one basically says, design this your wall. Um, our loads are due to earthquakes, so we have these 30 chips distributed at each level. And we're assuming an 8-inch clay masonry wall with the tight S BCL mortar, the total plan length is 24 feet, and our thickness, we're going to use 7.5 inches. And the problem told us to assume an effective depth of 285 inches. So this is just kind of um, the given information that we might need for a problem. And then over here is our axial loads. So we're going to be using the maximum, which is down here on the first floor, of our 360 dead load and 75 wide load. Um, so this problem, it was nice enough to give us the shear moment, so we didn't have to calculate it. So these are just costs from our 30 chips at each level to get a maximum of 120 and 3,050. So when we're working through this problem, the first thing we want to do is figure out our controlling load combination. And in this case, it's going to be the 0.6 dead plus the 0.7 earthquake. Um, might not necessarily need that in other problems. So we want to calculate our moment and our shear and our axial um, factor loads. And from there, we can calculate our shearing, shearing capacity that is on our actual wall. So V over BD, and we've got the 84,000 and then the BD for the problem. And we have 39.3 PSI is our calculated shear stress. So next we're going to want to figure out what the allowable shear stress in the masonry is. And to do that, we need this M over BD value, and we, you'll see that they're unfactored, and we got 1.26, which is greater than 1. <coughs> so when we come over to this formula, we're plugging in that 1.0. Um, this problem was nice because it gave us a masonry allowable shear stress of 81.5 psi, which is greater than that 39.3 psi, so we don't need any shear reinforcement, additional shear reinforcement. So that's pretty sweet. Um, with this problem, you do need to make sure and check your flexural design. Um, an example in the design guide, it does go into that for the sake of time. I didn't put it on my presentation. Also, if you did find that this masonry shear reinforcement was less than the uh, if the allowable was less than, then you know you need to add the reinforcement. And you would just use these two combinations to figure out how much you need to reach the allowable high enough and then with the spacing and bar size, you can figure it out that way, so you get when that works. Um, I was also going to mention some, oh, I didn't put the strength design method on here because it was, like I said, they changed the code so that they would match, and they essentially matched just converting it to shear and moment instead of using the shear stress. So, um, 
So for special sideline consideration, this is for uh, the areas of SDC, D, and higher. They actually have a maximum reinforce requirement, so you want to make sure you don't go above that. Um, it asks that you use, it's like highly suggested that you have a very symmetrical layout, so that in the case of an earthquake, an uh, intense earthquake, it's going to respond similar to how you expect it to. Um, materials that they have in the code, it specifies certain types of mortar and cement that you're not allowed to use for these high seismic zones. Um, there, the code, I don't know there. <laughs> and then your ductility, because masonry is stiff and it's not economical to design it super with a um, linear, uh, I can't think of the word right. But <laughs> uh, you want to make sure you keep it within these ranges over here. That's what this is. Um, and it's got that equation to help you with that. Um, I already mentioned how the reinforcement, uh, it varies based on what type of masonry, reinforcement masonry you're doing as to what the maximum is. So you just kind of have to vary based on what you're designing. You need to make sure you keep in mind story drift and like the P delta effects. You want to make sure that it's not going to deflect too much that in an earthquake situation. You want to make sure that it's anchored properly, and that one is in the code just based on what type of reinforcement you should make sure you're going to do. Um, I already mentioned reinforcement. For the boundary elements, it's basically these. Highly specially reinforced elements you can attach to the ends of your shear wall, and by using them, it actually allows you to bypass the maximum reinforcement requirement. So that if you need more reinforcement, you might consider adding boundary elements. And then finally, I was going to talk a little bit about moment resisting wall frames. So this is basically just a giant shear wall with holes in it. So instead of looking at it as like four different shear walls, you can look at it as one giant shear wall. And this is just an alternate approach to designing it. You're welcome to do either way. It's just kind of what it goes up to you. If you do design it as a frame, you need to keep in mind that it's going to behave with um, a critical joint between the pier and the beam. And when it's using frames, it often just calls column and pier, switches them up. So you're going to have bond failure or diagonal shear failure. And when you're designing these, uh, the philosophy that you're keeping in mind and that like the equations are derived from is basically that plastic hinges are going to form at the end of the beams. There's going to be beam, column, joint.